I've lived at 12714 West Taft since 1993. It's just on the other side of the trees over here. I have no plans whatsoever of moving. Love my neighbors. Love my neighborhood. Love our schools. Love our congregation. But it's still kind of fun to look, right? You know, go on realtor.com, maybe go on pray to homes. If nothing else, just go into the neighbor's house who's selling it, you know, and check out, well, what'd you do with your kitchen? Well, what about your living spaces? Check out this backyard. Oh, man, this is awesome. And you just kind of think about what life will be like living here. You know, I'm sure there's other people out there that kind of indulge themselves in this fantasy of that someday move into the dream home, you know? Or you, you leave behind all the old problems of old spaces and, and the frustrations with the, the way things are maybe in the neighborhood. And then, you know, you, you get into that, that perfect place. Well, whether or not you ever leave your neighborhood and your home, I can assure you without a doubt that you do have a dream home waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And like a Remax agent, the angel of St. John shows us around to all the amenities that are available in this new, shall I say, exclusive gated community. <laughs> As the angel says, oh, you're going to love this? There's a river that flows right through the city. There's this gorgeous tree of life that spans from side to side. It has new fruit every month of the year. And the leaves of those trees are used for the healing of the nations. And as for the neighbors, how about God, you know, face to face with the Almighty? How's that for a neighbor? And you, you are going to reign in this new home and this new neighborhood forever and ever. That would sell it, right? I mean, come on, this, your new home sounds wonderful. Why? They're all new construction, built to last, and, and finally there is healing of the body, of the mind, of all your relationships. And there, you get to reign under the authority of Jesus. Now, I don't know if you have any idea what that means to reign, but you know, it's good to be the king, right? Kings do what they want, right? You'll get to do whatever you want, and guess what? At that time and in that place, it will be exactly what God the Father wants done all the time. Oh, and speaking of God, He's there. Uh-huh. Oh, not up in the clouds somewhere. Not in your heart, whatever that means. Face to face, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No more night, no more darkness, only light, only goodness. Yes! This is the hope of the good news of Christ. This is the message that he has for you of just what this hope is. Why you and I really need this hope. And most importantly, how do you get this hope? There's a lot of confusion out there. Some people aren't so sure what the next step is going to be like after we pass through this world. They think somehow that just, you know, the soul is finally freed from the confines of this nasty body and world, and we finally drift into the ethereal, wonderful divineness of Godness, whatever thatness means. No way. You're getting a new body. You're living on a new earth in which there'll be all kinds of food to eat, all kinds of beverages to sip. And there will be lots of things to do. You'll have meaningful work. All of the arts, all of the music, all of it there and, and just enjoyed in which there are trees and lakes and, well, everything that's very familiar here will be there. But you know the thing that is just hard to imagine, hard to wrap your mind around just how different it really is going to be but it's what's happening on the inside of the human being. Because on the inside, it's so radically different. Here, there is no longer any jealousies or envies, no longer any manipulation so that, well, people will think, I'm wonderful. No longer are there the, the, the coveting and, and the judgments of one another. 
there is flowing from within us this great love for the others. No longer a status of who's great and who's not, just love. And it flows out of a heart that is so completely and utterly filled and satisfied. All of the longings satisfied from this love of God, there is this peace and contentment. This is the hope. And it's clear and, and picture of what it is. And I mean, you just think about why you need this. Why you need such a clear and vivid, accurate picture of hope because you and I, we're hope-shaped beings. And that how we live now is completely shaped by what we expect to happen in the future. I mean, there's just kind of a silly story about really makes the point, though. If you were to take two guys and put them in a room for 10 hours a day, six days a week, and made them do this tedious, awful job of making widgets, whatever that is. And, and, they, and there they have to stay, and it's repetitive, and, and it's the same, it never changes. But And then you tell the first guy, we're going to pay you 20000 annual salary. You tell the second guy, we're going to pay you $20 million every year. Well, after a few weeks, the first guy, he can't stand it. He's like, I hate this job. My hands are killing me. This is terrible. I quit. You look at the second guy. Well, are you going to quit too? He can't stand it. Same job you're doing. It's like, I'm good. You know, he's going to keep doing it because of what's happening in the future. He's going to get the 20 million, right? The 20,000. It's like, ah, oh, this isn't worth it. We're just that way. So that if you are the kind of person who just isn't so, so sure about what's going to happen next. You know, maybe when you're dead, you're just dead. You know, your, your atoms just kind of disperse back into the universe and you're gone and remembered no more. If, if you believe that there isn't an afterlife and that there's, there's no judgment day, there's no God who has a reward and He's going to come and give it to whoever He wants, you live now with a very different heart and mindset than, say, on the other hand, if you really believe there's this new heaven and the new earth. And, oh, yeah, there's a judgment day. Nobody's getting away with anything. All the wrongs are righted. And thank heaven, this, this God has provided a way for my wrongs to be purified through the, the blood of His Son, Jesus. And, and this God wants to live with me forever and ever. That kind of hope is powerful. And in fact, so powerful is its accurate and clear picture that this enabled people throughout history, and it's verifiable, enabled them to face all kinds of injustice and evil and, and problems with, with great courage. In fact, this entire revelation was given to John so that he might give it to a people who were suffering terribly because of they were followers of Jesus. Some of them were being covered with pitch and burned alive. Others of them were being crucified in honor of their Savior. Uh, others were being gathered and thrown into the stadiums for arenas to be eaten by wild animals. And yet these people, because of this powerful, clear, accurate hope that they have in a life yet to come, they were noted, and this is historic facts, that they would sing the Christian hymns as the animals tore them from limb to limb and their bodies were burned. They had a poise and a courage and a joy, so much so that the more that the Christians were killed, at that time the Christian church grew even faster. The blood of the martyrs was seed that was sprouting up all over the world. It was noted that these people, that they have something, and they did hope. Well, there are many other examples verifiable in history. And at least a more recent and American example of this hope is found in the African-American spirituals, in the songs that were sung. There was a man by the name of Howard Thurman, and in 1947 he gave a lecture to Harvard University, and it was in response to the criticism that these spirituals were so otherworldly, all about thrones and crowns and river of life and what is to come. And, and the criticism was that it, it just 
really did a disservice to the slaves. So I've made them docile and submissive, whereas they could have just risen up and thrown off their shackles. But Howard Thurman, he looked squarely into that criticism, and he responded by saying to them, the facts make clear that religion, the Christian religion, deepened the capacity of endurance and the absorption of suffering. What greater tribute could be paid to religious faith in general and their religious faith in particular than this? It taught a people how to ride high to life, to look squarely in the face of those facts that argued most dramatically against all hope, and to use those facts of the Scriptures as raw material out of which they fashioned a hope that in the environment with all of its cruelty could not crush. Because the slaves really knew in their hearts and in their minds that there is a new heaven coming, a new earth, that all of my desires will be satisfied, that there is a judgment day, and that all of the wrongs will be righted. And that day is coming and it is sure. It en enabled them to face all of the cruelty and the injustice and gave them an experience and, and enabled them to reject annihilation and affirm a terrible or ferocious right to live. That's the power of an untouchable hope. It's out there. It's not dependent on what happens here. Now, I know that living here in West Wichita, that nobody's going to be dragged out to a field covered with tar and set aflame. I know that our families will not be taken to a street corner and sold like cattle like the slaves. I know that we will not face any of what they really had to, and yet, every person of every age faces a world that is quite cruel and would sap all hope of this world out of us. But with this clear, accurate, vivid picture of hope, we can at least face what we face with the same resilience and peace and joy and courage that all the others of faith have faced their lives with this hope. You see, the big question becomes then, how do you get this kind of hope? Well, if, if your hope is dependent upon, uh, you know, something happening here in this world's timeline, you know, when I finally get this job or when I, when I finally get better or when, when this finally, if, if your hope is dependent here, it's too fragile. It doesn't have the power to withstand all of the cruelty and of this world. And if your hope is vague or inaccurate, it will not have the power to face the counter claims that you have no hope. You'll be left with, well, I hope so, or I don't know so. How do you get this kind of hope that faces exactly what you and I face? And there's some really hopeless things that we, as you get older, you know, just going to the hospital and being with somebody who's just had a stroke and they're elderly, going to recover? They're not going to get better like, you know, when you're young and youthful. The next thing that really happens is death, but it seems even very far away. How do you have the kind of hope that gives you a terrible right to live and a ferociousness that says, my hope is untouchable? How do you get that? Well, you have to look inside of yourself to see what you are already hoping in. Because we are hope-shaped creatures. We don't live without a hope. We grab onto something. And if that something is not Christ, if it's of this world, it will not have the strength. You see, the real hope that is untouchable is Jesus Himself, who has a reward. He says, I'm coming soon and my reward is with me. Everything that you've heard in the book of Revelation the river, tree of life, forever with God, the new earth, the new body. That's my reward, and I am bringing it. And, and who's he going to give it to? He says, I will give to each person according to what he has done. 
Now, when most human beings hear stuff like this, we go, uh oh, that's bad news because I know myself. I know I'm not worthy of any of this. And we know that we can't try hard enough to get anywhere with God. And, and so rather than to focus on yourself, like how am I going to make myself worthy, incline your ear to hear Jesus and how he actually answers this question. Who does he say will receive his reward? Who is worthy? And listen to what he says. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They may have the right to the river of life the tree of life, and go through the gates into the city. It's not about you. It's about receiving the cleaning, the washing of Jesus in holy baptism where all of your sins and your life has been buried with Jesus. You've been given this new life that's untouchable. Listen to Jesus as he says, let the one who's thirsty come. Let the one who wishes Come and take the gift of the water of life. See, Jesus doesn't want to exclude anyone. His invitation is out there for all. This hope, which is powerful, which is untouchable, waiting for you, is yours because of Jesus. And as you live a life then with Jesus, He anchors that hope ever deeper into your soul so that you can face whatever you face, and it is often cruel and mean, and there is no resolution here in this world, but there is in the one to come. And knowing how hard that is, I have a card for you to take home. And it simply has a prayer to pray all week that says, what am I hoping in that is not of you, Jesus? And allow him to answer that and show you so that your hope may truly be in Him. And then each day, Monday through Friday, there is a short Bible passage to help lock in your ear to listen to the King, the Lord of Lords, who is your hope now and forever. These cards are on the exit table as you, as you leave today. So this is our hope, and now we stand to confess our hope in these words.